After drilling this topic several times on this channel, it's time we put everything into perspective and come up with a few conclusions. Prior to starting this series, I always thought that going to Mars was challenging, but within reach. I always thought that we need to have a colony on Mars, we need to live on different planets. I must admit, my research into the subject was shallow at best, for when I started to look into it more, it became pretty clear why people gave up on this dream after the moon missions. From the risks involved to the costs associated with such a journey, everything seems to be working against us. When Elon Musk first unveiled his interplanetary transport system, I thought, like so many of you, that we'd have a base on Mars by the mid-2020s, or at least by the end of it. Now I'm not so sure anymore. Sure, we'll probably land there, take a few pictures and get back home, but like the Apollo missions, based on everything we know so far, this human space race isn't going to last very long for several reasons. And let's face it, the current design of the Starship won't take humans to Mars. It might take cargo as discussed in the previous videos which I have linked below, so make sure to pause this video and check those out before continuing this one. And so we're going to conclude this series about Starship concerning the gravitational effects experienced on the journey and what SpaceX needs to change in its Starship design in order to secure humanity's place amongst the stars. Hi, I'm Ohms and welcome to Ohms Law. A lot to break down for today, so let's start off by turning all these statements into bullet points. The current design of the Starship won't take humans to Mars, and this is due to many reasons. 1. The lack of artificial gravity. Even if the Starship were to travel at 100,000 km per hour, it would still take it around 6 months to arrive at Mars. 6 months in a zero-g environment will wreak havoc on the human body by itself. Last time, we discussed the various effects of zero-g that the human body experiences, ranging from blood, muscle and bone loss, to changes in the ion channel and the immune system. It should go without saying that I barely even covered the consequences in the previous video, so viewers should take this into account when thinking about space travel. We elaborated last time on NASA's RIDGE, short for space radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from Earth, gravity fields, and hostile close environments, and we only discussed the distance from Earth and the gravity fields, including some of their influences on the human body and the mission itself. Launching from the ground will expose the astronauts to roughly 3 Gs, which is not much of a problem since they would have trained for that anyways. Then they'd have to, I guess, spend a few hours at best or months at worst in the microgravity of low Earth orbit, waiting for the starship to be refueled. If they don't have gravity here, this could be a very serious problem. They'd have to exercise rigorously roughly 2-3 to three hours every day in order to mitigate the effects of microgravity. Without a spinning starship, these effects will compound over the next 6-8 to eight months as they will be experiencing no gravity at all on their way to Mars. Also, spinning the starship will prove to be a difficult task on its own, even if other vehicles are used alongside trusses or strong cables, and I'm hoping I can discuss that in my next video, but let's keep going. Once they arrive there, and according to the SpaceX website, the ship has to mysteriously shave off 99,000 km per hour in the Martian atmosphere. This is absolutely ridiculous. The Starship cannot do this without some sort of propulsive maneuver happening prior, like what happened with the Emirates mission, Hope. And I'll get back to this point later. According to their site, the crew will experience a peak acceleration of 5 Gs, I bet that's gonna feel great after 6 to 8 months of no gravity. Can you imagine experiencing 5 times Earth's gravity after over half a year of experiencing this weightless underwater feeling? But hey, don't ask me, let's ask a NASA astronaut. According to Tom Jones' article on airspacemag.com, during the space shuttle re-entry, the forces put on the body as the craft decelerated through the atmosphere were only 1.7 Gs, and usually just a normal 1 G or so. But the peak deceleration lasted for about 10 minutes, which was quite a strain to withstand after living in weightlessness for just a couple of weeks. Get this, weeks, not months or years. He describes that the spacesuit felt like it was made of lead. And this is just returning from the space station. Can you imagine arriving on Mars and having to experience five times those effects after being weightless for months, not weeks? just to shave off the incredible velocity you need in the first place in order to get there in less than 6 months. So, let's go back to how on Earth is the Starship supposed to get rid of 99% of its velocity in the Martian atmosphere prior to the suicide dive. To the suicide dive. 
This maneuver won't work as well, and I think recent testing by SpaceX is confirming this. I think some viewers are misinterpreting the success they are seeing. The current SN10 prototype is estimated to have been falling on an average between 324 km per hour and 360 km per hour. In comparison, a skydiver reaches about half that speed while falling, so this thing is going very, very fast. But it's not fast enough. Let's look at the simulation on their website, which has been bothersome to analyze due to how simple it is and due to the conversions on the site. SpaceX claims that Starship will experience a hyperbolic re-entry at 7.5 kilometers per second. It's also kind of strange why they use kilometers per second instead of kilometers per hour, but whatever. This basically means that Starship will enter at 27,000 kilometers per hour. So that's ridiculously fast. How did it decelerate from 100,000 to 27,000 kilometers per hour? No clue, but let's keep going. Then it says it will be traveling at Mach 2.5. Again, changing around the units so that we all get confused, but anyways. Mach 2.5 is basically around 3,087 kilometers per hour. So based on this, Starship is supposed to decelerate from 100,000 to 3,087 kilometers per hour, purely using the Martian atmosphere which is much thinner than Earth's atmosphere, about 99% thinner actually, and we have no way of knowing if the vehicle is capable of doing that in the first place. According to the prototype, this ship isn't even traveling near 3087 km per hour, let alone 1000 km per hour. So, to put it into context, the prototypes you are seeing now need to be tested at speeds that are almost 10 times more than what we're seeing. Sure, Mars has a thinner atmosphere which might affect drag differently, but I just want to call attention to this plan of rapidly igniting the engine near the end. If the Starship is traveling at speeds much higher than the prototypes we are seeing, and according to the SpaceX website, the Starship is decelerating from Mach 2.5 or 3087 km per hour to Mach 0 0.5 or 617 km per hour in 14 seconds, making the acceleration be negative 49 meters per second squared, or roughly the peak acceleration of 5G as mentioned on their site, then we have a serious issue with what's going to happen to the crew. Again, even 2G will be extremely strenuous on the astronauts who just spent months in a zero-G environment. To wrap up this point in the best way I can, there is not enough information about how Starship is supposed to shave off over 73,000 km per hour of speed aerodynamically in an atmosphere that's 1% the thickness of Earth's. And when you look at Perseverance and what it had to do in order to slow down its velocity, parachutes, rockets, sky cranes, etc., and that was all to deliver just over one ton of cargo on Mars. It had to shed its excess weight, perform all the operations in perfect timing by itself, and SpaceX wants to do this using a hundred tons. No parachutes, no sky cranes, or shedding weight. Nope, just a last minute firing of its engines, subjugating the crew who have had a long journey to the most terrifying forces imaginable, as they have not experienced any gravity for a while. It's safe to say at this point that this isn't going to be the plan for people. It might be for cargo, but never for people. The safest plan for this is to have the Starship undergo orbital insertion and then descend to the ground. This can be done with multiple vehicles, but in any case, this will help the astronauts assess the atmosphere and weather before attempting a landing. Weather on Mars can be a disaster like on Earth, so like SpaceX factors in weather here on Earth, it should come up with a plan to deal with that while approaching Mars. You wouldn't want to be traveling for 6 months in zero G, then arrive to a dust storm happening on Mars with no means of stopping your vehicle from entering the atmosphere. Number 3, and finally, the length of the journey. Using chemical rockets to get us there is outdated technology to say the least. Sure, SpaceX has dramatically improved this sector, but let's face it, we need better technology. And luckily, NASA has just the right engine for this, the thermonuclear engine. Powered by nuclear fission, hydrogen is heated to 2400 degrees Celsius, almost half the temperature of the surface of the sun by the way. This hydrogen is then accelerated through a nozzle. This type of system was considered for the Apollo missions, and a lot of research and development was done by NASA in regards to this system. It has even recently received over $124 million from Congress in order to advance the system and consider it for future interplanetary missions. 
Using this type of engine will definitely get us there in less than half the time, and even then, the effects of radiation, lack of gravity, isolation, and the rest are all still risky. Even if the journey is three months going, staying for a couple of weeks, then three months coming back, the six to eight month trip will need to be undertaken by the most qualified, trained, and experienced crew ever selected by mankind. They'd have to train every day, keep up with their physical and mental health, be constantly monitored minute by minute. Even if we had a small crew of 10, the undertaking will still be immense. Carrying all that food and water and equipment will require several starships, and emergency gear or tools that need to be sent out on the spot can't take 8 months to a year to get there. Emergencies can't take years to be solved. They're either solved quickly or everyone's dead. The interplanetary transport system needs to have the nuclear thermal engine as its primary means of transportation, while the chemical rockets can be used for surface-to-orbit transfer. This would also minimize the amount of starships needed to get people to Mars. Instead of having Super Heavy go up and down four or five times in order to refuel the starship, we can have the current chemical design launch from Earth once, carrying the passengers to another ship with a nuclear thermal engine waiting for them in orbit. Getting that ship in orbit can be done separately to minimize any risk of radioactive fallout and can be done using the Super Heavy. This will also remove the need for orbital refueling, a technology that has been untested and will definitely take a lot of time to do so. So here are the three main conclusions from this long series. However, our journey really doesn't end here. Next time I'm hoping to discuss the solutions to all these problems and place down a roadmap of what to expect in the next two decades when it comes to SpaceX and Mars. Let me know what you guys think in the comments and if you think Starship will be the vehicle that'll take humans to Mars. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and as always thank you for watching.